All right, everybody, welcome to the True Crime News for this week. I'm Morgan Rector. And I'm Rachel Telfor. All right. Uh, so, uh, first of all, what did you think of the Richard Cottingham episode? Very well done. I was so excited. Thank you so much for doing that. And I hope everyone enjoyed it because I don't believe a lot of people knew about him yeah, and what a think, fucking yeah. psychopath he was. So, yeah, completely messed up. You did great. I loved it. It was perfect. So thank yeah. you so much for doing that. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I actually might go back and listen to it again because I was multitasking. So I kind of want to re-listen. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's another reason why I've had a daughter and I found out she was uh, working as an, a quote unquote escort. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd have to go and get her, bring her off the streets because they're in big danger doing that shit. I mean, mo through most serial killers, they go, this just is easy. It's easy pickings. You know, people, well, they think nobody cares about them. And also. You know, and unlike a woman that you meet in a bar, the pro if you got money, the prostitute is going to go with you and mm -hmm. you're going to bring her to a place where there are no witnesses around. So it's just easy. Yeah. Yeah. I hope everyone enjoyed that because it was, I was I loved it. Oh, really I came up with this joke today. You know what a gilf is? Uh, like grandma. grandma. Yeah. Fight. Grandma like to fuck. I yep. came up with this pickup line. Hey, baby, I'm bad for your hip. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh god <laughs> i can't wait you I, I could be the bad boy i am there you go all Get right yourself a, 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 a expense or a rich one though so you can oh, have okay. money too okay so my first story was suggested by a member of the human monsters podcast group her name is luann sayo i heard i hope i'm pronouncing the surname correctly um so uh, the headline is Jennifer Teague's killer heads to prison after pleading guilty. This is in uh, Canada, the city of Ottawa, which is the capital of the country. An mm -hmm. Ottawa man was sentenced to life in prison after pleading guilty to planning and committing the murder of 18-year-old Jennifer Teague in 2005. Kevin Davis, 26, admitted to first-degree murder Friday before Ontario Superior Court Justice Monique Metevier. In a courtroom packed with at least 100 spectators, including Teague's family and friends. Teague disappeared after her evening shift at a Wendy's restaurant in the Barhaven neighborhood on September 7, 2005. Her body was found 11 days later on a trail near Moody Drive. Davis was charged with first-degree murder nine months later when he was 24. Earlier in January, Davis's lawyer, Gary Barnes, said he intended to plead guilty and Davis did as expected. A conviction of first-degree murder carries a sentence of life in prison without eligibility for parole for 25 years. Afterward, the Crown, or which is a district attorney in Canada, mm -hmm. read a statement of facts that came mainly from a six-hour interview with police in June 2006 in which Davis confessed. Davis hunted for a victim. Many of Teague's family and friends cried straight through the statement, which revealed that Davis had been hunting for a week for a girl to rape and murder. He said he wanted a young one who would be easier to control, and it was only a random opportunity that led him to choose Teague. Davis claimed he was unable to consummate the rape he planned. He said he strangled Teague in his own bedroom while his mother slept in the next room, the statement said. The statement said Davis's hatred of women for rejecting him was part of his motivation, along with his anger at the world for a range of perceived offenses, including being fired from Home Depot and even the death of his cat. Uh, the details included many that Teague's family had not heard before. Her mother, Jean Teague, t told uh, reporters outside the courthouse that the hardest part was hearing her daughter's last words. My mom will be worried. Oh. After the statement of facts, family and friends described the effect the slaying had on their lives. Teague's friend Kaylee McEwen told reporters afterward that Teague was, quote, the most happy person I've ever met in my life, and she still lives in fear after her friend's murder. I don't walk at night anymore, she said. I carry pepper spray on me at all times. Uh, Davis cons is consumed with guilt, according to his lawyer. 
after the victims, uh, Davis said, I deserve nothing less than the punishment that I received here in this courtroom today. And if I could give my life to bring back Jennifer, I would do it without hesitation. He said, his voice breaking several times in his first sign of emotion throughout the day. Outside the courtroom, Barnes distributed copies of his client's handwritten statement. He said Davis is consumed with guilt, adding that it is extremely rare for someone to plead guilty to first-degree murder. Teague's father, Ed Teague, expressed doubts about the genuineness of Davis's apparent remorse. He said he watched David as he and other friends and family described the impact of his daughter's murder on their lives. An impact statement is supposed to have an impact, and I wanted to see if there was any reaction, and there was nothing, not a flicker of emotion. Teague's mother, Jean, said she was relieved by the guilty plea. I'm glad he saved us the agony of going through a trial, she said. Hmm. Barnes said Davis will be taken to Kingston area for an assessment before being assigned to a correctional facility. Well, if it's in the Kingston area, I guess he's going to Millhaven Institute, where um, institution where Paul Bernardo lives. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So this reminds me of um, like the, the book Mindhunter, where he was just the common denominator that that FBI agent found with most of these criminals is that basically they're really pathetic people. Mm -hmm. They're losers and they blame the world for their failures. And yeah, what, what did he blame it on? His cat died and what else? Something other. Cat Dude. died. He lost his job at Home Depot. Oh my God. Women rejected him and. Well, cry me a river, dude. Those aren't actual problems. So, yeah. if that's your uh, coping mechanism, then you are a sad sack. Yeah, should have just got canoe. Should have gotten another cat. Maybe. Yeah, just buy another cat, and another job. Yeah. Come down to come down to Florida. We have plenty of jobs. Yeah, right. There's no shortage of cats around either. <laughs> that is a fact. <laughs> <laughs> or cougars. <laughs> <That's true. Yeah. laughs> All right. Funny. So what's your uh, first story there? Um, so we did get another submission from Mary Beth Hall Krasnov. I hope I'm saying that correctly as well. It's a short story and I tried to find it's it's so new. That there's, it's a very small snippet. So I'm interested to see um, how this lays out, but it's from Meridian, Mississippi. Um, and it's, it says, man involved in porn robbery caught and charged. <laughs> so Meridian police arrested one of three people believed to be involved in distributing, in distributing crime. Investigators say Vernon Scott took part in an armed robbery after filming a voyeur style porn film at an abandoned building on Azalea Drive on Sunday, the 11th. Police say Scott got angry when the videographer paid his partner $100 for shooting the film. Apparently, Scott wasn't going to get paid at all. Mm. Scott, Scott then allegedly went to the car, grabbed a gun, and pulled it on the videographer, demanding the videographer pay him $200 through Cash App. Wow, that's a smart idea. Yeah, I could make a record of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let Let's. What What would you put as like the emoji? Like, there's no nudity in the emojis, so that'd be an intro. Okay, whatever. Yeah. The victim was able to distract Scott by yelling, "I think the police are coming," and then throwing his phone as a distraction. He then jumped in the car and sped away. Police say Scott fired two shots at the victim's car and chased the victim down the road in the buff. Vernon Scott is charged with shooting into a vehicle. His partner in the robbery has not been charged yet, but police tell us that they plan to charge him with accessory. So they were filming a porn, a porn, and this guy got mad that he was not getting paid for doing the wow. porn. <laughs> it's so hard for us men to get paid for sex. I mean, damn. Yeah. I wonder, was the other person? Oh, hang on. His partner? It just says his partner. So I wonder if she was a, she much I wonder if she was a female or male. Yeah, that's interesting. Probably that, a female. That partner, I don't know. I find when people use the word partner, it's it doesn't describe heterosexual relations, you know. That's true. I I hmm, See, now I'm interested. Now I, want, I I looked, I looked and looked and looked for other for further information, but the, I I couldn't find any yet. Yeah, like for some reason, new. like for some reason, the media, a lot of people still have trouble. Referring to like a gay man's uh, boyfriend as a boyfriend, or same, I know. same deal with lesbians, like to say she, it's her girlfriend, it's her wife. 
I don't know right. why they always say domestic partner or partner. Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, as long as they're being gender identified correctly, you know, using the right pronouns, if they identify as wife and wife, then yeah, they're married. You know? Well, I think I think one concern they may have is that um, some people ask like gay couples, like, you know, who's the male, who's the female who takes on those roles? And yeah, that's not the, an acceptable question. Yeah, they don't like that. So maybe that's one of the reasons why they don't do it. So. No. Yeah people yeah people what do you got for us morgan all right my next one now that sometimes we do stories from uh the dustbin of history and this one it's about eight years old but i'm using it because uh it's uh there's there are two stories i'm doing that involve animals committing crime which is really funny uh so the headline for this one is Drunk and Boorish. Swigging. I have an old one, too. That's so funny. We are so weird. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah we, we, we both have animal stories this week. A swigging And pig. dustbin ones. Yeah. So campers told to lock up food and drink in Australia after a feral pig goes on a bender. Uh, okay. This is Western Australia and ended up in, and ended up in an altercation with a cow. <laughs> I've, I've heard of dogs drinking beer. I didn't know pigs were drinking beer. Of course, it's Australia. It's either okay. that or Florida. Well, Australia, that's there's tons of wildlife in Australia that are yes. going to kill you. That's for sure. Exactly. Yep. All right. Let's a hear it. A rampage by a feral pig that consumed 18 beers has prompted warnings for people at campsites to properly secure their food and alcohol. The pig struck at the De Grey River rest area east of the remote western Australia town of Port Headland in the Pilbara. According to the ABC, the animal was seen stealing three pack, three six packs of beer. <laughs> campers. I don't know how he got them open. Maybe just bit them open. I know. Before Watch. ransacking rubber, before ransacking rubbish for bags for food, one camper reported seeing the pig guzzling the beer before getting involved in an altercation with a cow. How? Uh, yeah, the, there's a quote here. In the middle of the night, these people camping opposite us heard a noise so they got their torch out and shone it on the pig and there he was scrunching away at their cans so he just chewed them open just I guess. chewed them and then like yeah. probably tilted his head up did yeah. the, did the old uh beer pong or beer bong type type of style or me may, or maybe he bit into it and like when it starts spraying out he like licked at it or something like that yeah know. so then he went and raided all the rubbish bags there were some other people camped right, right on the river, and they saw him being chased around by their vehicle by a cow. Uh, the pig was reportedly last seen resting under a tree, possibly nursing a hangover. <laughs> Feral pigs are considered an invasive pest in many parts of Australia, Here owing too. to the diseases they carry, which can infect livestock. They also damage crops and compete with native species for food. Uh, yep. Several state government advise people to report sightings of feral pigs so they can be removed. The feeding of the animals is also discouraged. Yeah, they have um, – the Europeans brought a lot of new species to Australia, and they've had problems with some of them, like uh, like mice. I don't think there were any mice, mm -hmm. and now there, there, there's, like, plagues of, like, millions of mice that show up. And, God, that would uh, suck. Oh, yeah, I saw, like, there was an episode of The Crocodile Hunter where he, he was talking about in, introduced species, and they showed, like, a barn. The floor was mice. It was just made out of mice. They were just running through. It was unbelievable. Well, we have that problem in the Everglades when people released um, um, Burmese pythons, and now they're an invasive species, and they're literally killing fucking everything. Wow. And everybody, so we have a there's an open like hunt there's like contests for hunting them. Really? Uh, and capturing them, yeah. I actually have a would you rather that's um coming up. Oh, I see. Yeah, Florida is like Florida is probably the worst place to introduce a species because yeah, given please the, don't. Climate, the climate, they can't die, right? I mean, you put like a like a, an alligator in Canada, it's gonna die, you know, right the rolls around. But uh yeah, you you can introduce anything to to Florida, so it's got problems. Well, and they, and they're so bad they they're kill they eat alligators. They eat alligators. They're, they're, they there has been photos of them eating. It, they're they are killing and eating everything. Oh shit! It's a it's not so everyone's like oh, you know the people who are getting down on 
Florida for having this python killing. They're destroying a natural habitat and they are an invasive species that are not supposed to be there. So sorry, but not sorry. They they need to it, it's it needs to be done. It's well, just, it's, it's illegal horrible. here to own it's illegal here to own snakes like that. But somebody had like two of them and um, so they somehow got out of their aquarium or whatever it was. And they, they they managed to go from his apartment to the apartment below him where there were babies. Oh, God. And it killed. Oh, I don't, no. There, I don't know if there were two babies or one, but a baby died because the python killed it. No, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. I don't want to hear that. No. Yeah. yeah. See, that's – don't do that. Well, I mean, uh, I have a friend who I won't name any, any names here, but she owns a couple of snakes like that. And I didn't know this about snakes. But when they decide to mate, they're into that fatal attraction kitchen counter snack sex, man. I'm telling you, like they they get on her shelves and they knock shit over. It, it was unbelievable. They're they're wild, man. I thought they I'm just not against having snakes. My son wants a, a ball python and I, I'll probably get him one. I'm just concerned that the cats will, will try to get after it well, and may only get, you know, yay big. And yeah. I've had ball python, so I know that, you know, they're. They're they're really cool to have. I mean, they're awesome, but I want to make sure that everyone's safe in the household and no animals are going to get harmed or anything like that. So I'm holding off a yeah. little bit. Yeah, I don't know if snake if uh, cats will go after snakes or not. I don't know. Uh, well, or a snake after a cat. My my 17 year old cat is in the mid- midst of dying, so let's not give her oh, any more yeah. anxiety. <laughs> yeah, don't, she doesn't need a snake around too. She does not need a snake around. No. All right. What's your next story? Um, it's funny. I actually, I, well, I have two dog stories. This one is is um, a newer one. And a friend of mine posted this. It's a local story down in Naples. So I don't live far, far away. And it is um, deputies arrest man accused of having dog fighting ring at Golden Gate home. Um, huh. Yeah. So total piece of shit. As a 40-year-old Golden Gate man has been arrested after deputies found evidence of dog fighting at his home. Rafael Jesus de Ve- Ugh, I'm gonna not Del Vella Hamaron. Okay, there we go. I did it. Yeah. <laughs> Turned himself in Friday afternoon, according to the Collier County Sheriff's Office. De Vella Hamaron uh, faces four counts of animal cruelty, causing cruel death, pain, or suffering. One count of animal fighting and one count of selling, possessing, or using equipment for fighting or baiting, the sheriff's office said. Detectives say Delvea is described by deputies as a convicted felon who operated a dog fighting ring in his home in the 2100 block of 52nd Lane of Golden Gate. The investigation began June 9th after deputies learned of possible animal abuse at the home. Deputies observed multiple dogs with apparent injuries in metal cages in Delvea's uh, backyard, deputies said. Deputies also found multiple roosters with injuries and lost feathers and an above-ground pool filled with sawdust dust, which they say was used as a baiting device. I wonder how the hell that works. I don't want to know, actually. Never mind. Uh, Those who live nearby say that they were surprised to see this happen in their neighborhood. Quote, it's a quiet neighborhood. You know, everybody talks to everybody, you know, Uh, end quote, says Angel Mendoza. Another neighbor didn't want to be named because they live, they believe they could have ties to one of the injured animals. Quote, last July, we were outside. I just came home from work and two little puppies came running down the street and we were playing with them. My teenage daughter actually saw an ad on Facebook for two puppies that were lost, and it turned out they lived really close to us, end quote, the neighbor said. That neighbor said they never actually saw anything out of the ordinary with the animals. Quote, no, nothing. Not even the day that we returned the puppies. There was nothing out of the ordinary that I would say there's something sketchy going on, end quote. Six female bull terriers, one female hound dog, two male bull terriers, and an injured rooster were seized by authorities. Two of the dogs were pregnant. Authorities also found steroids for animals, the sheriff's office said. Uh One of the dogs found had 249 scars and wounds, while another had 109 scars, the sheriff's office said. 
The animals were examined and cared for by the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the ASPCA, and will remain in the care of Collier County Domestic Animal Services. Quote, these innocent animals injured or endured repeated torturous abuse, suffering and pain. Uh, Collier County Sheriff Kevin Ramsbox, Rambosk said in a statement, we are pleased that we, along with our partners with the Humane with the American Society for the Prevention and Cruelty of Animals and Collier Domestic Services have delivered them safe and healing to a healing environment or bringing their abuser to justice. De Valle Hamaron remains in Collier County Jail. Um, the friend of mine who posted this is actually a very big dog rescuer. Her mm -hmm. name is Megan. I'm not going to use her last name. And she supports, it's actually a local organization here called Big Hearts, Big Dogs, um, dot com. So if anybody feels like they want to donate because these people are pieces of human crap and they take in dogs that are injured from fighting rings, rehabilitate them and try to rehome them. So. <laughs> oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. yeah but, it's, pretty, it's pretty horrific what happens in these dog fighting rings. Like if a dog doesn't die, it comes a lot, comes back. With just tons of wounds and yep. and uh, I mean, 209 it, wounds is significant. Yeah, it's uh, it's just barbaric. It is but, barbaric. Yeah, that football player who had that going, he deserved everything. Michael Vick. Michael Vick, yeah. Yeah, he what, can he can suck a bag of dicks. Considering what football players get paid, he obviously did that just because he's a fucking sociopath. Yep, exactly. 100%. So he didn't need the money, so there's just, I guess he's just. You just thought that was fun. So you yeah. can go suck a bag of dicks, crooked yeah. ones. So, yeah, I think that didn't he lose his career over that? Like they. Yeah. Out? Yeah. 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 That's good. It is good. Hooray. Uh, so I, have another, I have another animal article. Um, this is uh, nine animals that committed crimes and were caught red handed. These are just. Together? Some these are just some short blurbs. That's oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so w number nine is Bridget, a six-year-old cat from New Zealand, was very interested in men's underwear. So so much so that she broke into people's houses to steal socks and underpants. Keeping, <laughs> keeping cats indoors is not a common practice in New Zealand, so Bridget kept coming home with more of her textile prey. Eventually, oh. the... Eventually, the owners of the furry burglar tried to give the stolen underwear back by handing out flyers. Is this your underwear? Is that your Can underwear? Can you imagine what? making a fly? Hi. Yeah, My I cat saw. Bridget is a total kleptomaniac, and I'm so sorry, but are these your underpants? And, like, you post a fucking <laughs> – that would be the most amazing post poster I've ever seen yeah. in my life. That I would wonder, be epic I how she broke in too i don't know if there's yeah. doors or what but Man, you're sneaky as shit okay the next one is number eight uh maybe you've seen this before i know i've seen an like some video of it the mm -hmm. chip addicted seagull those seagulls mm -hmm. are generally known for stealing food from people this one went a step further by terrorizing a small bakery shop in scotland it was notorious for waiting until someone left the shop and then it casually entered and picked up a bag of chips. Although it happens very often, nobody does anything about it, and the seagull is quite the celebrity now. I've seen it too. It's a funny thing because people who are good at shoplifting say, just act casual, don't look around, don't mm -hmm. act like you're nervous, and they they just won't suspect anything. And that's what this seagull did. You see it? They just walk in and walk back out and yeah, very quickly, well, smoothly. I have said before on the podcast, and I will say it again, as a resident of Florida living by a beach, seagulls are vultures. You yeah. cannot, they, if you open a bag of chips, if my sons are eating on the beach, they ha I'm, like, I'm like, honey, you have to keep the bag closed. Don't drop any crumbs. They will flat out lit, come and get the shit right out of your hand. They, they really? there are zero fucks given. Yes, you cannot do not. So people who feed them, the the uh, tourists that feed them, we cannot. We're like, dude, don't do, don't do it. We yeah. can't stand them. Don't do it. Um. Also, we've had raccoons. We were at the beach one time. Mm -hmm. There were some bushes. Raccoon comes right out of the bushes, gets right into my bag, grabs a bag of Doritos, 
runs its ass right back in the woods. I have a video of this. I'll send it to you. Holy and then shit. came back and got another bag of chips. And we're like, what the hell? It's because people are feeding them and they have no yeah, they just they, they don't care. Just yep. don't care. They're ruthless. But that's hilarious. Yeah, have you done the thing where I know you're not being on bridges, but have you done the thing where you go to a bridge and fish off of it? Because I know it's a lot of people in yeah. Florida did that. And yeah. uh, so you get the pelicans coming after you. That's kind of a ch- yep, that's the fish. Happen. Yep. Yeah. If the, you have to keep them at bay, because I guess they'll go in, they'll take it all, right? If you're not good. Yeah. Careful. Well, we came in from fishing. Actually, we went uh, fish. I had deep sea fishing just a couple weeks ago, and we came in, and there's a bunch of pelicans just waiting for us at the docks. So yeah, you gotta be careful. All right. So the next one is uh, number seven, aggressive Tyson. Swans are usually a synonym for grace and elegance, yet the mm-hmm. citizens of Bugbrook, Northamptonshire in England know their other side. They can be aggressive and protective of their habitat, especially when they are raising their youngsters. These birds are known to attack swimmers and sink kayaks. The most famous one, Tyson, is a force to be reckoned with. They are badass swans. Yeah, that is true. They look like they'd be harmless. But those nah, appear- I think they're like geese that can sometimes be assholes. Oh, yeah, and they're loud, too. I sent you a photo. Oh, yeah, I see. Uh, those, are those, those are pelicans that got right on the – was that on yep. the boat or on the that dock? That was on the boat when we came on the do- at the dock. Yeah. Uh, okay, number six is uh, Fred the Baboon Ganglord. So uh, this is it from Cape Town, South Africa. <laughs> Fred even has his own page on Wikipedia – he assembled okay. a gang of baboons in Cape Town and reigned over them, stealing from as many people and cars as he could. The picture that came with that was some person's like walking down the street carrying groceries, and he's reaching right up into one of their bags because some kind of stock vegetable was hanging out. I think so, I've seen a video. Do, do they like go into people's houses and steal their shit, like go into people's windows and stuff? They probably do. Because uh, I think I saw a video on this. Well, the, a couple the, times. Best, the best one I ever saw, and this is how intelligent primates are. There, so some tourists went somewhere where there are wild monkeys. And this one, he, he snatched a man's eyeglasses off his head <laughs> and he wouldn't give it back uh, right away. So they had, the man had to negotiate with him. He'd offer some a little piece of food. It wasn't enough. He had to keep offering him more and more things until finally – when the monkey was satisfied, it gave him back the eyeglasses. That's hilarious. So he, he held them hostage. I love it. Um, number five is Otto the octopus. So this is this is an octopus that lives uh, in in an aquarium. So uh, marine creatures are also in on some shady business. Otto, an octopus, has caused chaos in his aquarium by performing juggling tricks using his fellow occupants, smashing rocks against the glass. And turning off the power by short-circuiting a lamp. He uses his occupants and juggles them. That's very. Uh, that's not nice. With his eight arms. <laughs> little fish, I guess. I Do don't you know. Ima- God, I want to see that. I'm googling that as soon as we get done with this podcast. Yeah, obviously. He's, <laughs> well, they say that octopi uh, have the intelligence level of like a five-year-old human. Yeah. I guess that's not too far-fetched that he could do that, and he's probably pissed off about living in an aquarium too. For sure. All right, number four is the Blackfriar parrot. Just like today, it wasn't uncommon in the 19th century to have a pet parrot. However, the bartender's parrot at the Irish pub, the Blackfriar, was the cause of a huge fight, making salty comments about a lady in the bar. Her companion was not pleased by this and thought the bartender himself had said all of it. One thing led to another, and a true bar brawl started. Oh, that's amazing. So the parrot learned all kinds of uh, derogatory statements from the bar flies and ended up saying one to a woman. And the man thought it was uh, the bartender who said it. Yeah. If I had a parrot, I would. would well, we had a, a cockatoo, mm-hmm. a white, big white cockatoo, which we all kind of hated, except for my mom, because the fucking thing only like my mother. So to the rest of us, it was just an asshole. They can be. Yeah. Oh my god, he was he would and he could get out of any cage. He was really smart. Um and he would he would say things. We taught him to say like words and stuff, but mostly he just screeched. So we would put his cage outside because it pissed us off and my mom would get mad. And then he would get out of his cage and we'd find him like running around the backyard 
chasing cats. I'm like, Jesus, I can't with this fucking animal. It's ridiculous. My, fa- my favorite Kid Rock lyric. I bought a what? couple of parrots that like to squawk and they sound like you and the shit you talk. Yes. Great uh, lyric. Yeah. Yes. That's a that good one. It. That was him at his uh, the apex of his brilliance. That's correct. Uh, okay, the next one is three housebreaking crocodile. In 2013, Guy Whittle found a quote unquote morning present under his bed in Humani Lodge, Zimbabwe. It was a 330 pound giant Nile crocodile oh that God. snuck in while Mr. Whittle was asleep, remaining in the house for nearly eight hours. Luckily, no one was hurt. Yeah, so there was a picture of it. Crocodile just went under his bed. So I'm not afraid of alligators. Crocodiles are different. Uh, if anybody doesn't they, know, yeah, I think they're more aggressive. Yeah. And they have different snouts. That's how you differentiate. But but if I woke up to find that under my bed, I'd shit my britches. Oh yeah, yeah. For sure. Well, it's, well, yeah. No, it was probably waiting for the guy to put his freaking feet down so we can no, bite his leg and then roll around with him right uh number two is mouse crime gangs so i meant i mentioned the plagues of mice this uh, is being, great yeah being highly intelligent creatures mice have figured out that they can form groups to attack homes and other places one of the most famous attacks was on a 98 year old veteran in australia he woke up with numerous bites on his hands neck and ears now that doesn't sound horrific but it, That's it is. Sad. That, that would be, be horrific. Are you are you scared of mice? I'm not scared of them, no. Just, just but disgusting. I wouldn't like them. By I mean, I just no. I'm not. I'm not scared of them. I wouldn't want them in my house, though. Well, yeah. That's. I mean, it's. Bad I'd rather that. deal with mice than frogs, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if anyone has problems with frogs in their home. I so. do. Oh, but you mean in your home? Yeah, they get in. We live in Florida. They're everywhere. Well, they well, they haven't gotten in this one yet. Well, they but. won't last long, right? I mean, I don't know. I can't stand most of their, them. I hope they all. Because most of their food is outdoors, and so they eat like insects and shit. Yeah, they want to be outside, but they do get in. Especially we have garages, so they're very much into garages, and that was oh, a terrifying. Yeah. I don't have a garage anymore. Thank God, because <laughs> I was terrified every time I went outside in the garage. All right. Okay. The last one is Jack the Husky. Uh, crime unknown. So the whole Twitter got in on the investigation when a Philadelphia lady tried to find a dog to adopt. She stumbled upon Jack, a Siberian Husky, who had a very nice description with one exception. He cannot be legally adopted or raised in Maryland, USA. It intrigued the woman so much that she took it to social media to find out what the dog had done to be forbidden to go to that state. There's a couple suggestions. He was involved in a series of pet shop robberies. During his two years on the lam, he robbed 24 pet smarts and pet goes. He literally stole thousands of bones and doggy snacks. Part of his parole is that he isn't permitted to be a resident of Maryland. And the next one, unpaid barking tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Those are probably just jokes, I guess, but... Oh, that's the best. That's like a good dad yeah. joke. I love that. Uh, well, the, uh, <laughs> love well, it's it. a funny thing about husky. I read one thing I read about huskies. They don't like. They don't actually see you as an owner. They only want to see you as a companion, and that's why they can be difficult. Like to, if it doesn't want to take a bath, it'll start mouthing off and shit. Mm-hmm. They're not big into the idea of being, yeah, being being owned. They want. They want to be your buddy, not your, your pet. So that's supposed right. to be the challenge of having a Husky. Yeah. Uh, all right. What's your uh, next story? Well, I'm going to skip down then since you just did a pet story. Cause I'm sorry, but you know, Rachel likes to bring it down to a super morbid, disgusting, horrible story, which <laughs> is also about a Husky. Um, Ohio woman with history of animal related citations charged after pet Husky dies in a hot car. Oh. So I'm going to preface this with saying that living in Florida, there are a lot of child and animal deaths in hot cars. Yeah. Um, it's a problem. It's hard and enough walking around outside in that it, heat. Correct. It's, you know, 140, 60 degrees inside of a car within minutes. So I actually say I, I was back when I was working 
as a sales rep, I was at a doctor's office and I saw a little dog in a car during the summer. I called the police. I, I was so angry. I was shaking. And had they not gotten there just one minute previous, I was going to knock the window out. And we're, we actually are allowed to do that and would not get in trouble in the state of Florida. Um, but I went inside and I had asked the um, doctor's office attendants, the front desk person, I'm like, can you please ask who the hell this owns this car? This lady came out. She wouldn't even look at me or talk to me. I'm like, you are a piece of shit. How dare you? And she like, she got into her passenger side car door, which is really strange. And she like, just would, she just sped off, but I got her license plate. I got all her information and they went after her because I, I was like, you're not, no, you're not getting away with this. It was just the craziest thing. But I hate these stories. Well, if she would do that to an animal, uh, then that means she's a selfish, self-centered narcissist mm -hmm. and uh, doesn't think she does anything wrong ever. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. And she just didn't want to even face me. And I'm literally in her face just going after her. And I'm, she just got in her car and drove away. Anyway, so this uh, lovely douche cunt. Um, an Ohio woman with a history of previous animal related violations faces a felony charge after her pet husky died inside of her hot car. And second of all, huskies are meant for colder weather, so they're very insulated. Yeah, that too. Yeah. According to the Parma Police Department, Casey Wise has been charged with one count of felonious prohibitions concerning companion animals. According to a police report obtained by a local TV station, Cleveland 19, an officer responded to Wise's address after she reported that her husky was locked inside her car and appeared to be motionless. Body camera video uh, viewed by People shows the officer arrived to unlock the SUV as Wise pleaded for help. After seeing the dog inside, the officer called for assistance from Parma Animal Control Officer Judy Kosick. When Kosick arrived, she found the dog dead inside the vehicle. According to the video, the outraged animal control officer demanded that Wise be taken into custody. Quote, he's dead, Kosick says. Quote, I want her fucking arrested. End quote. Love this woman, by the way. Yeah. As a police officer led Wise to the police cruiser, the video shows Kosick yelling at her, quote, get out of here before I fucking kill you. Nice. End quote. Wise has uh, had reportedly told the 911 dispatcher that the dog had been in the car since approxi approximately 4 a.m. that day, nearly 11 hours, according to Fox 8 News. Jesus. After a video of the arrest went viral, the Parma police issued a statement apologizing for the officer's use of profanity. Do not apologize for her use of profanity. Fuck that. She was absolutely 100% okay with that. Quote, our animal control officer is passionate about her job and animals. End quote. The statement reads, she regrets allowing her emotions to get the best of her. And in this matter was counseled by the safety director about her reaction. No need to be. Uh, the statement continues, quote, it is important to note the defendant has current charges pending a significant history of 20 citations since September 2020 for animal related violations, including Jeez. animal running at large, failure to comply with requirements for a dangerous dog, failure to comply with rabies vaccination requirements, failure to comply with animal registration and failure to comply with quarantine. Wise has been released on bond. She has not entered a plea and the arrest does the arrest report does not list an attorney authorized to speak on her behalf. Man. So yeah. she'll just continue to do it because she doesn't get in trouble. You know, whenever I've owned a dog, it just drove me crazy that there are people who own big, aggressive dogs and don't put them on leashes. And, you know, I, I know someone who has a little Bichon and one time she was walking her and a fucking German shepherd came down from somebody's Aww. yard. And, and uh, they got that same instinct most species have to go after the little thing. And mm -hmm. uh, that little dog, uh, she's... Uh, She's not a scrapper, really. So sure uh, it's really uh, irresponsible behavior. Absolutely. Yeah. And that and I I applaud that animal control officer for her, yes. <laughs> her words. So I'm I, sorry she got in trouble because she I would have said the same thing. 
I don't think I'd leave a tarantula in there that long. I no kidding. I don't think I'd leave a frog in the car that long. To be honest with you, that's how bad I'd feel. Well, it's like my my uncle was well, maybe telling a frog, me, maybe a frog. It's like my when my uncle was telling me about the heat in Florida in summer. He says, yeah, like if you go to like uh, Walmart or something in your car, you, you get out of the car, you run in the store, and then when you're coming back out, you run to the car because it feels oh, like you're sun, sweating. The sun is attacking you. It feels like it, it, it was the feels like today was 102. Wow, I don't know what yeah. that is in Celsius. Uh, have, let me see. Yeah, sorry. Um, we're we're stupid and not in the metric system here. Let me see. So Celsius calculator, and let me just take a look here. Celsius to Fahrenheit. So what would you say it was? 102. Feels like the feels like degrees. Okay, 102. So 39 degrees Celsius, that is really fucking hot. That's yep. very, very hot. Yep. And humid. So. And humid. Holy shit. Yep. So you should just, yeah, you should put deodorant on all, all your entire body. Just so you don't go outside. You just do yeah. not go outside unless you're going to be in water or that's it. <laughs> or air conditioning. Going to your yeah, car to like go to speech, air conditioning. Like, a, like an astronaut suit with, with air conditioning. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All God, right, so my next story my next story was also suggested by a listener. Her name is Emily Nydert. This is uh, a recent one. And Thank you, Emily. Yeah, and it's, it's a long one, too, so okay. brace yourself. Uh, this is a, quite a lengthy story here. Braced. This is out of Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, Wyatt Dean Lamb, a suspect in the death of two-year-old Athian Rivera, has been oh. charged with a toddler's murder. The Laramie County District Attorney's Office announced late Monday afternoon. Lamb is charged with first degree murder and 10 felony counts of child abuse with injury. His case is set for a preliminary hearing at 9 a.m. August 6th in Laramie County Circuit Court. After an initial appearance Tuesday morning, his bond was set at $1 million. Lamb was arrested in February for violating bond conditions in a separate case and he has been held without bond in the Laramie County Jail since March and is awaiting trial. Um, a statement was given by District Attorney. I commend the Cheyenne Police Department, the Laramie County Coroner, and the Wyoming State Crime Lab for their collective efforts in this case. Uh, so, you see, the, the little boy, uh, Athian, was, a was little boy. Okay. Yeah, he was reported missing by his mother, Cassandra Orona, around... Uh, 1 p.m. February 19th, his body was discovered around 3 that afternoon in a dumpster located mm-hmm. just outside an entrance to Orna's apartment, located in the 400 block of Desmet Drive. You know, I don't know what's worse, not knowing where the body is or oh finding it. Oh, my God. It. I don't know either. I, yeah. I, if I found a, a – oh, I can't even think about it, to be honest. Like I, I'm sorry. I can't finish if I that. If I had a child who was murdered in a horrific way where they were, like, mutilated and whatnot. I, I don't know if I could live. Yeah, I would just say cremate it. I don't want to look at it. No, I, 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 yep. I, I probably wouldn't be able to survive that, to be mm. honest. Yeah, I would just uh, – I mean, yeah. I, don't even, I don't even know if I want to see the dead body of anybody I care about, but uh, <sighs> especially that. Uh, yeah. The toddler died from brain swelling caused potentially by blunt force trauma, restriction mm. of oxygen or both. According to a probable cause affidavit filed Monday in Laramie County Circuit Court, uh, the coroner, Rebecca Reed, determined Athian died between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. So February 19th. His body was wrapped in a fitted bed sheet and a blanket, which were inside five black plastic trash bags. You fucking piece of shit. Uh, the pathologist said uh, there were scattered blunt force injuries over much of the body including multiple contusions and abrasions, as well as burn marks on the toddler's genitals, upper legs, and groin area consistent with a handheld torch found in the apartment. This is horrible. This is a bad story. Holy shit. What do you think they mean by torch? Like a blowtorch? Yeah. Yeah. According to an autopsy conducted by Reed and Wilkerson, Wilkerson issued the autopsy report which ruled Athian's death a homicide, uh, he had, he advised Reed that the cause of death was cerebral edema with herniation with three contributing factors, blunt force injuries, suffocation, and thermal injuries. He said Athian was the victim of non-accidental trauma. 
Uh, he also observed complete or partial collapse of a lung or lung area, which he say was caused by suffocation or manual strangulation. Uh, the autopsy was conducted uh, February 20th. And um, let me see, Let's skip ahead here a little bit. So, yeah, it occurred within one block of the of the family's home. So Lamb has been charged with felony, uh, sorry, felony strangulation of a household member, misdemeanor property destruction, and interference with a peace officer after an incident involving Arona. He is currently awaiting trial in that case. And uh, let me see. So there's more legal stuff here. All right. Um, so his mother said she lived in the apartment with Athian and her two other young children, and that Lamb had moved into the apartment with them in August 2020. Orna said oh, that. Oh, so he lived with them. Oh yeah, she told. Okay, detective, great. Yep, she told a detective she had to be at work at 5:30 p.m. February 18th and left the three children in Lamb's care as she normally did while at work. So she communicated with Lamb throughout her shift. At one point, Lamb told her Athian had vomited and was coughing. She told Lamb to keep an eye on the toddler and that she would take him to the doctor in the morning. Uh, she returned home at 3.30 a.m. and went to check on the children, who were sleeping together in the same bed, as they often did. As she was putting a blanket on them, she said Lamb turned out the hall light and she was unable to see. When she asked what he was doing, he turned the light back on and walked away. Orna then smoked marijuana with Lamb in their bedroom until about 4.30 a.m., when they both fell asleep. The next morning, Orono said Lamb asked her if they had clean sheets. He said he wanted to change the children's sheets because Avian had vomited earlier, that he would take care of it, not to worry about getting up. Why are you just worrying about it now? Yeah, that's a weird time to do that, eh? Okay. Orona told the detective Lamb was being nicer than normal. Also, children were using any excuse to, 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 to get to sleep, right? So they would say something if... One of the kids puked in the bed. Yeah. At around 8.30 a.m., Lamb asked Orona to drive her daughter to Goins Elementary School because he was worried she would be late. Orona said this was out of the ordinary and that even if the girl was late to school, Lamb would walk with her because it was such a short distance. The three left the apartment, leaving behind Avian and his brother, who were still in bed. Mm. Orona said she and Lamb returned to the apartment at about 8.40 a.m. and smoked marijuana together. Oh, you guys are okay. Wake and bake. Cotton's yes, constant uh, pot use here. No Avian, pot. No, actually, oh, sorry. No, uh, nothing against people who do that because I actually have friends that do that. But first of all, you went to bed at like 4:30 and yeah. you're up at like, and you're not taking care of your kids. So let's well, I don't make think, some priorities. I don't think people should be high when they're taking care of their kids. I don't think that's a good idea at all. Even well, if you're, it depends. I mean, even sometimes if you're it can make chill. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on the dosage, too. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if you're doing, like, 10 bong rips, I don't know if that, how functional you're going to be. Yeah, but, but, like, a couple, then you can be really creative. Then you can be like, oh, yeah, dude, let's do this really cool project and get into it. So, oh, like, not saying like, that I do that, but, <laughs> yeah, you can, you know, sometimes, sometimes it makes you creative. Anyway, go on. <laughs> I want to hear the end of this horrible story. Yeah, Avian's brother was awake, but Orona said she did not see Avian and believed he was still asleep. Orona went back to bed at 9.30 a.m. While she was okay. in bed, while she was in bed, Orona said Lamb was going to do chores and that she heard him opening trash bags at one point. At about 12.15 p.m., Orona said Lamb woke her up and told her Avian was missing and that the apartment door was open. Orona said she panicked and searched the interior and exterior of the apartment separating from Lamb while they were outside looking. Orona said the apartment complex's maintenance man helped her search for Avian, and the property manager encouraged her to call the police, which she did around 1 p.m. Lamb then left the apartment because of an outstanding arrest warrant, but returned around 1.30 p.m. while Orona was being interviewed by detectives. And uh, Lamb told detectives he lived in the 2500 block of Deming Drive with a roommate. He said he was with the children on February 18th, beginning at around 3.30 p.m. And that uh, repeated the thing about how Avian vomited once during the night. And uh, he, so he went and checked on them afterwards. And there's some details here just kind of repeated from earlier. Um, let me see here. 
So, yeah, after learning Avian had died, Arona told detectives she believed Lamb might have been trying to keep her away from Avian the morning of February 19th to hide what he had done. So during an interview... Why didn't she... Why? Sorry, I don't want to... In that case, because what you said previously, she had gone, smoked weed, went to bed, woke up, went... There was no checking on the child to make sure that the children were okay. No. My first thing to do would be to go check I every single morning. And and you know what people one dude, one stupid troll like bitch about me always talking about my kids. Dude, go fuck yourself. I am gonna talk about my kids because I'm a mother and that's what I do. And why not? I don't care. But that's the first thing I do is go check on my children. So how have you gone that long without checking that, on your kids? Yeah, that is all uh, anyway. Sorry. Uh, so during an interview with detectives, the apartment complex's maintenance man said he was in front of the management building at about 12.50 p.m. March uh, 7, February 19th, when he heard a blood-curdling scream. No. He ran toward the scream and found Orona, no. who said her tw- two-year-old had gotten out of their apartment and had been missing for about 45 minutes. The maintenance man began to help Orona look for Avian. He said he remembered a trash truck had emptied the apartment complex dumpsters between 12.30 p.m. and 12.45 p.m., and he said he told police they should stop the trash truck. Yes, he good job. Yeah, he later told detectives that after his initial interaction with Arona, he saw a man on a bicycle on the south side of the complex. He said he thought it was odd that the man simply stared at him and did not ask what it was going on or offer to help. He later identified the man as Lamb after seeing a photo of him. The apartment complex manager told detectives she was contacted by Arona outside her apartment at about 1 p.m. February 19th. She said Arona was upset and crying and told her Avian was missing. The manager said she saw Lamb in the apartment, that his face was blank, and he did not seem upset, worried, or flustered. A oh, school resource o- yeah, a school resource officer interviewed Arona's daughter at around 3 p.m. at her school. The girl said her mother and her mother's friend, Wyatt, had brought her to school that morning and left her brothers at home because they were sleeping. She said Avian had vomited sometime during the night. A surveillance video from the elementary school obtained by police showed Lamb, Orona, and the girl arriving in Orona's vehicle at about 8.40 a.m. February 19th. A trash truck operator for the city of Cheyenne confirmed he emptied the dumpster close to Orona's apartment at about 12.35 p.m., police secured and sealed the dumpster Avian was found in, taking it to the police department. Uh, during a search of Verona's apartment at 7.32 p.m., February 19th, detectives found a roll of black, trash, black plastic trash bags consistent with the bags Avian was found in, along with other sheets that matched the one he was wrapped in. Upon searching the dumpster, Detectives found another trash bag containing items similar to those found in Orona's apartment. Lamb called Orona at 1.24 p.m. February 21st from the Laramie County Jail. During the call, Orona confronted Lamb about Avian being found in sheets and trash bags from the apartment. She recounted the events of February 18 and 19 to Lamb, saying she'd been thinking about Lamb's actions during those days and accusing him of lying. DNA tests and fingerprints seemed to show Lamb had tied the knots on the trash bags Avian was found in. DNA for the win. DNA. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. Yeah, that my... is a horrific and really good. Who, who um, sent that to you? That was, uh, let me go back here. Um, that was uh, Emily Neidert. Emily, good story. Wow. Nice. Not nice. Fine. But that's that's bad. And this is one of those crazy things. Like, how the hell do you not hear about this? Um, You know, more in the news. That's. Outstanding. Have you ever heard of um, the Cinderella effect? uh Uh-uh. Well, it's this um, ancient instinct, not a good one, where basically when men become stepfathers, um, they often end up uh, either abusing their stepchildren or even in some extreme cases like this, killing them because back when we were, you know, just apes or, you know, cavemen, men would, they would, if, if they took over uh, a spot where like another man had been killed, they would kill her, 
the woman's children or run them yeah. off. Yeah. That, that happened routinely. And kind of like a lion in a li- in a pack, a, li- a lion pack. That's right. Yeah. They won't, they won't uh, provide they won't allow other males. Offspring. Yep. So mm-hmm. that's unfortunately that exists in our species and my stepfather beat the shit out of me. So yep. unfortunately yeah. evolution hasn't weeded everything out yet. So. But you know what, Morgan, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Yeah. Or crazier. Or crazier. And or, we end up doing podcasts like this. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or as the Joker says, stranger. What, what doesn't yeah, kill exactly. Us, stranger. Yeah. All right. That's what's your- a really, oof, that was a tough one. Holy yeah, shit. That was a dinger, yeah. What's your next one? Um, my next one is out of Chicago. Uh, rapper shot as many as 64 times as he walked out of Chicago jail. Shit. This was recent. Well, some people never learn. Right? Yeah, I'm telling you what, man. Uh, Chicago, a man who apparently am, uh, was apparently ambushed after being released from the Cook County Jail in Chicago suffer, suffered as many as 64 bullet wounds to his head and other parts of his body, police said. The shooting Saturday night killed uh, Landre Sylvester, 31, a police report said. He was pronounced dead at a hospital. NBC Chicago reported the victim was a local rapper who went by the stage name KTS Dre. Sylvester had been released after being fitted for electronic monitoring and was walking to a waiting vehicle when several suspects, quote, exited two separate vehicles and all began to shoot in Sylvester's direction, striking him numerous times, end quote, the police report said. The killing comes amid a rise in shootings this year in Chicago and a broader concerns nationwide about increasing violence. On Monday, Chicago Police Superintendent David Brown was among city and law enforcement leaders around the United States, meeting with President Joe Biden about efforts to reduce crime. Following Saturday's night shooting, the suspects reentered their vehicles and fled the scene, police said. A 60-year-old woman who was with Sylvester was shot in one of her knees and was hospitalized in good condition, police said. A second woman who was in her 30s suffered a graze wound to her mouth, police said. Sylvester has posted, had posted $5,000 bail on Friday. The Ch- uh, Chicago Tribune reported he had been ordered, ordered held on a $50,000 bond on July 1st after prosecutors last month hit him with a petition for violation of bail bond for allegedly failing to meet conditions of his release in a 2020 felony gun case. So it sounds like he was a snitch because mm-hmm. he was he was wired up and somebody found out about it. And so they just rushed him when yeah. he was getting out and shot him 64 fucking times. <laughs> Shit. Uh, did they sorry? What did they, they see what his real name is again? Uh, yes, it was uh, Le- Landre Selvis. Uh, Sylvester. Oh, so that's his real Lond- name. Okay. L O N D R A. Yeah, Landre. It was he was known as K T S Dre was his stage name. Oh yeah, I was just asking because uh, my next story involves someone being called a snitch and a rat. <laughs> so, oh how weird! We are fucking so weird. Is it? Yeah, we're. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not synchronicity, but uh, yeah. No, it is. It is synchronicity. <laughs> we're synchronized mentally. Uh, we both did a husky story, and <laughs> we do this every week. It's really yeah. freaking straight. It's kind of weirding me out. Yeah, right. so I mean, a lot of these gangster rappers, you know, I think sometimes their credibility is attacked. Like, yeah, you talk about shooting people, and I and mean, let's talk. Let's go back to Biggie and Tupac, man. Come on. Yeah, yeah, but it's like, you know, after a while, I guess people start challenging them. Say, yeah, you you wouldn't shoot anybody. You're not that hard. You're just you're full of shit. And then they feel like, well, maybe I do have to prove it, right? Yeah, but snitches get stitches, so. Yeah, that's true. Actually, in Florida, snitches end up in ditches. <laughs> oh, ditches, yeah. Kidding, guys. I haven't killed anybody yet. And the gators eat them, I guess, yeah. That is correct. Everybody. Yeah. Okay, so my next story, uh, this is uh, from the FBI. I, I was fascinated by it because I'm fascinated by crimes that are committed by, by female offenders Especially Ooh. if they're really egregious crimes, like I love your sh- FBI files. Yeah, not like shoplifting or drugs. I mean, this is different. Okay. So, right, and then no. is from out of Texas. An Amarillo woman was sentenced today to 34 months in federal prison for harassing a sex trafficking victim in an attempt to dissuade her from testifying against her trafficker. Announced acting U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Texas, Prerok Shah. 
Desiree Lujan, 29, pleaded guilty to witness tampering in March. She was sentenced Friday by U.S. District Judge Ada Brown. According to plea papers, Ms. Lujan admitted that she threatened to beat a sex trafficking victim for cooperating against defendant Tremont Blackmore, who was charged in September 2019 with operating a large-scale human trafficking operation. So, yeah, it's not So she was going after him because he was a trafficker? He so one of his uh prostitutes uh, okay. threatened to to name him to give, to inform on him. Gotcha. And, and this chick is her, his sister and she threatened I mean as oh, if it's not, okay. if it's not as if it's not bad enough that the girl's a sex trafficking victim. Yeah, got then a, she has this this douche canoe. Okay, yeah, okay, cunt canoe. Okay. Yeah, so Mr. Blake Moore, aka Magnificent, uh, allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah, right. Allegedly forced multiple women into commercial sex and slapped, punched, choked, and kicked victims he believed were not being honest or making enough money for him. He is slated to go on trial on August 23rd. Like all defendants, Mr. Blake Moore is presumed innocent until guilt, proven guilty, of course. Uh, Ms. Lujan, a member of Mr. Blakemore's alleged trafficking organization, admits she outed one of Mr. Blakemore's alleged victims on social media, calling her a snitch and a rat. Ms. Lujan threatened the victim with physical harm, warned the victim that she would post law enforcement reports about the victim online, and reached out to known pimps to reveal the victim's identity and cooperation. The defendant admitted she acted intentionally to harass the victim in order to dissuade her from testifying against Mr. Blackmore. You know, I I joke about pimps and sometimes, you know, it's kind of considered kind of a cool image to have. But I, I am also capable of seeing past it and being aware. Of no, how, in realism, they are they are horrible people. How horrific sure. it is to uh, especially the women who were forced into it or maybe they were drug addicts and. You know, basically they're keep, they're keeping them high, and then mm-hmm. exchange the girls selling her wares. Yep. But uh, the ones who uh, who have been forced into it, like runaways, that's, that's so really bad. the worst one. And there was this woman, um, she 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 got arrested. She was being trafficked, but she got arrested for prostitution while she was walking the beat. And she's in jail. And um, she asked. I think she said to the police like she wanted to talk to her family and they got back to her and said, yeah, your, your father's here to pick you up. And she's like, okay, great. So she would get, you know, return to her normal life and be back with her family. Well, it was her pimp who yep. claimed to be her father. And yep. like she said, she had no idea how he pulled it off, but can you imagine? They really like, do it all the time. Imagine you think that the nightmare is over and then that fuck walks in the room. I and can't. I can't imagine it, and it happens all the time, every day. And yeah, it was it was disgusting. uh, it was in the TED talk, and it was just this woman. She, she you know, she was a prostitute. It was just a really harrowing story. Ugh. All right, what's your next story? Uh, so I got a dustbin story. This is an older story. Um, happened. I think it was like 2014, 15. I want to say, but I ran across it somehow, and I had to do it because. It's one of those, fuck yeah, you did it. I don't feel bad about it. And it's a Texas story, so I'm following you. All right. And you guys might have heard of this because I think it was, it kind of got some, well, in the States, it got some news. A father who beat to death man he caught raping his five year old daughter will not face charges because of Texas state laws on deadly force. That's good. Yes, it is. See, sometimes we thank God for Texas. Was he wearing? I think I might have seen this before. Was is the mm-hmm. man wearing a cowboy hat in court? Uh, he might have been. I'll have to Google yeah. it in a second. Well, I, I well, I guess they all do. So you know what? I I Google it actually. I have to I have to look. So a Texas father who discovered a man raping his five year old daughter, uh, and beat him to death with his bare hands will not be charged with homicide under state law. A La, uh, Lavaca or Lavaca County grand jury decided not to press charges against the 23-year-old father in the June 9th death of Jesus Mora Flores, 47, 
who was killed inside a remote shack after he was caught molesting the young girl. Under Texas state law, deadly force is authorized and indeed justified in order to stop an aggravated sexual assault. And coupled with the fact that the harrowing 911 calls made by the father uh, backs claims he even tried to save the pedophile's life led to the jury's decision. Cool. Uh, Lavaca County Sheriff's deputy said the father, whose name was not has not been released to protect the little girl's identity, sent her and her brother to feed the family chickens. The boy rushed back to tell his dad that someone had grabbed his sister and taken her to a small secluded shack, and the father rushed towards his daughter's screams and arrived to find them both with their underwear off. Flying into a rage, the father beat Flores unconscious but attempted to call 911 for the rapist after he had made sure his daughter was safe. Sheriff Mika Harmon had said in June that he was not willing to press charges against the father. Rather, the case would be presented to a grand jury. At the time, Harmon said that the man was very remorseful and didn't know at the time he had killed Flores. Quote, you have the right to defend your daughter. End quote. Harmon yeah. told CNN at the time, quote, the girl's father acted in defense of his third person. Once the investigation is completed, we will submit it to the district attorney, who then submits it to the grand jury, who will decide if they will indict him, end quote. Mm. Indeed, the father is heard profanely screaming at a dispatcher who couldn't locate the property. Becoming increasingly frazzled, the father at one point tells the dispatcher he's going to put the man in his truck and drive him to a hospital before sheriff's deputies finally yeah. arrive. What if he put him in the cab and back? I mean, that's really her almost heroic and i wouldn't i don't think i do i would have even done that so the, yeah, i mean obviously he, he had remorse is is commendable well i mean um, it's a popular idea but i mean is, right. death, is death really justice i mean if the kid right alive, you know so he acted out of rage and then he's like oh shit you know yeah i don't want to kill somebody but good on him uh, Vian Huser, the father's attorney, sternly told reporters several times during a news conference at the Lavaca County Courthouse that neither the father nor the family will ever give interviews. Um, quote, he's a peaceable soul, Huser said, quote, he had no intention to kill anybody that day. The attack happened on the family's ranch off a quiet two-lane country road between the farming towns of Shiner and Yoakum. Authorities say a witness saw Flores forcibly carrying the girl into a secluded area and then scrambled to find the father running toward his daughter's screams. Investigators said the father pulled Flores off his child and inflicted several blows to the man's head and neck area. Mm. Emergency crews found Flores pants and underwear pulled down on his lifeless body. By the time they responded to the 911 call, the girl was taken to a hospital and examined and authorities say forensic evidence and witness accounts corroborated the father's story that his daughter was being sexually molested. Quote, under the law in the state of Texas, deadly force is authorized and justified in order to stop aggravated sexual assault or sexual assault. District Attorney Heather McKen told reporters in June. All of the evidence provided by the Sheriff's Department and the Texas Rangers indicated that's what was occurring when the victim's father arrived at the scene, she said. Authorities said he expressed regret at the killing at the time, and no evidence so far has led them to doubt his story. The girl's grandfather agreed it was it had been an accident. Quote, my son, sorry, the grandfather told the Victorian advocate in broken English, it was an accident. Lavaca County Sheriff Mika Harmon added, quote, he was very remorseful. I don't think it was his intent for the man to die. The residents of small Lavaca County town were largely in support of the father, saying the victim deserved it. Sonny June, a Shiner native, told the Victorian advocate he got what he deserved big time. Friend Mark Harboris reiterated this, quote, I agree with him totally. I would probably do worse. The family will have to deal with that the rest of their lives, no matter what happens to the father. Even if they let him go, he and his child will have to deal with that for the rest of their lives. So, yeah, of course. Well, I mean, you know, there's been a lot of pushes to create legislation so that anyone who sexually abuses a child, even if the, they did not kill the child, 
mm-hmm. they should be executed, but it hasn't been successful. But I'm thinking maybe uh, one punishment should just be to put them in gen pop. You know, if you're that's what I'm. That's I think we've talked about it before, and yeah. like I agree because that's going to be more torturous. To be yeah. honest, once yeah, you find like, out, once they find out that you're in, if you're like in a max security prison and you're found out to be a child molester, you're you're fucked. Yeah, I, you're uh, screwed. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, basically, you know, they they targeted someone who was vulnerable and couldn't defend themselves and yep. abused them, so put them in that same position. I saw a picture of this one guy who was uh, sexually abused a child, or at least one child. I don't know how many kids were victims, but he was wearing white pants and he had been raped by a bunch of inmates. The seat of his pants was fucking red from yep. the bleeding. It was unbelievable. Yep. Um, yeah, and what, you don't go. You don't go to. You don't go to prison as a child molester. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, I've been. I've been thinking sometimes like how, like a hundred years ago or two hundred <laughs> years ago, that was probably happening even more than it does now. But because mm-hmm. nobody would talk about any kind of sex at all, even marital sex. Right, and we didn't have social media and the news we have now. So. So yeah, I, I guess I don't know. Maybe children who experienced it back then didn't understand what was happening. Right. Or, or because sex was such such taboo as a conversational piece that they were they were just afraid to even mention it. Or so they I, didn't know any better. I mean, you've yeah. done stories where they they were you've done stories where they just thought that was normal. Oh yeah, like the goalers and yeah, the, they just like, didn't know that that was. And then you go out into real life, you're like, holy shit, I was abused. Like, what my, the hell? I, my first girlfriend was my sister. I found out that. Yeah, what? exactly. Like that kind of thing. Horrible. Okay. My next one uh, involves a U.S. district judge. Now, that's like – so I guess that's kind of like the judge equivalent of a district attorney. So that's like they don't just uh, preside over individual trials. I guess they Mm -hmm. they just preside over hearings, I guess. So acting United States attorney Dennis R. Holmes announced that a Peaver, South Dakota man – Convicted of abusive sexual contact, was sentenced on July 12, 2021, by US, U.S. District Judge Charles B. Cornman. David George Derby, age 24, was sentenced to 36 months in federal prison, 10 years of supervised release, and a special assessment to the Federal Crime Victims Fund in the amount of $100. Derby was indicted by federal a federal grand jury on August 17th. 2020, he pled guilty on April 12, 2021. The conviction stemmed from an incident on or about April 11, 2020, when Derby knowingly engaged in and attempted to engage in a sexual contact with his 17-year-old female cousin. Mm. The victim was incapable of appraising the nature of the contact, of the conduct, and was physically incapable of declining participation in and communicating her unwillingness to engage in the sexual contact, and Derby was aware of the victim's incapacity. Derby also knew the victim was his cousin. Derby and the victim consumed alcoholic beverages, and the victim became intoxicated. Derby perpetrated the sexual contact, knowing the victim was vulnerable and unable to give her consent to be to the sexual contact. He didn't. It doesn't say why. I guess maybe it's just presuming because she was 17. Mm. Uh, Derby was approximately 23 years old at the time of the offense, is an enrolled member of the Sistin Wapitan 08 Sioux Tribe. The Hmm. sexual contact occurred within the exterior boundaries of the Lake Traverse Reservation. Well, there is a lot of problems with sexual abuse in the indigenous reserves, that's mm-hmm. been a problem here, I guess. So I guess obviously it's a problem in the states. Um, I'm not gonna say it's a racial thing. Uh, maybe it's maybe it has to do with um, living in isolation because these yeah. reserves are way out in the middle of the country. Uh, There's not a lot of access to other people. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, it reminds me of something I read about the Amish. They don't practice incest consciously, but because there's this very small group of families in this tiny concentrated area. The families have been intermarrying for so long that there's not a lot of options. Yeah. Yeah. They're inbred. So they all have, a lot of them have these, the same kind of problems that people have when they're inbred. 
Um, so it, I guess, yeah, just being in isolation uh, can, that often leads to incest. That's been proven by uh, behavioral scientists. Um, yep. Not that I'm saying that, you know, Native Americans are. Not, we're not that. generalizing, obviously. No. Yes, I get what you're saying. But the con- but the conditions have been cited as the type that tend to occur within right. that kind of situation. But incest can happen in the suburbs. It can happen in the middle of the city too. And it can it- happen anywhere. Yep. All right. So what's your next story? Uh, next story is from North Carolina. A six-year-old North Carolina boy killed by a car that was allegedly street racing, and the driver was charged with murder. Oh. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's have a little fun and kill a little kid. Asshole. Yeah. A North Carolina man has been charged with murder after he allegedly got into a crash that killed a young boy while drag racing. According to authorities, Donnie Ray Cobb, <laughs> sounds North Carolina, sorry guys. Oh yeah, Cobb. Donnie Ray, Donnie Ray Cobb and another driver were speeding down US 74 on the night of June 26. That was my effing birthday. Going about 110 miles per hour when uh, the two cars collided, WBTV and WTVD report. The collision caused cars co- Cobb's car to cross a grass meridian into oncoming traffic and hit another vehicle, killing six-year-old Liam Liguanas and critically injuring his father, Santiago Liguanas. Cobb, who was also injured, is now charged with second degree murder and the death of Liam. In addition to murder, he faces charges of assault with a deadly weapon with intent to seriously injure, reckless driving, DWI, and speed competition, according to jail records obtained by people. Liam was weeks away from turning seven, his family said, and in the fall, he would be entering second grade. In his free time, he he uh, skateboarded, played Xbox, and practiced Taekwondo. Mm-hmm. Quote, from the bottom of my heart, my son was my whole world, his mother Brandy wrote on his online obituary. He was my whole heart. Everything I did was for him, to see him smile, to see him happy, and to show him love. My son always asked me what the best part of my day was. I would tell him he was. He would just smile. He always asked about his great-grandmother and grandfather and what heaven was like. He was so caring. He would always ask how our friends were doing because he genuinely cared so much. Wow. According to the Charlotte Observer, Cobb had a history of speeding charges, five of which were dismissed or reduced, while one filed against him in May remains pending. Cobb is currently behind bars in Gaston County Jail in a $1 million bond jail record state. The second driver is expected to face charges. Authorities told the Observer attorney information was not available on Monday. Well, life is not a movie, people. It's not the fast and the furious. Don't. Correct go street racing because someone's just going to get hurt you're not the rock i don't know if the rock i've never seen any of those movies there's like 4700 fucking fast and furious movies i'm like there i think one just came out i'm like what is this fast and furious 147 like after paul walker died like uh, or was it paul walker yeah i'm like let's just not let let it go yeah i think uh i think the only thing that slowed down that machine is uh it's COVID. Other than that, they keep grinding. Shit. You know? Who's watching these movies? Well, the assholes like you just read about now, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then they were under the, they were under, um, they were intoxicated. So yes. you're, fuck, oh, man. Great. So you're poor racing. Baby. So you're racing and you're fucking drunk too. Yeah. Oh, that, and that's... you killed a, a poor little innocent six year old. I just can't, I, ugh, right in the heart. Yeah. I have a hard time reading those. Sorry. Uh, All right. My last one is uh, the headline is $60,000 reward offered after child killed uh, and five others were shot in Washington, D.C. So a six-year-old girl was killed and five other people were wounded when a gunman opened fire Friday night in a Washington, D.C. neighborhood just feet from where police officers were stationed. Wow. That that takes place. Wow. Yeah. No kidding. The gunfire erupted shortly after 11 p.m. on Friday in the Congress Heights section of southeast Washington. Police officers who were nearby responded to the scene about 34 seconds after the first gunshot was heard and rushed the girl to a local hospital in a police car where she was pronounced dead. Uh, Police identified the girl as Naya Courtney. 
Uh, three men and two women suffered non-life-threatening gunshot wounds. Um, Conti said at a news conference, we will do whatever it takes to close this case in a swift and professional manner. Mm-hmm. Um, officials believe the gunshots in what Conti called a brazen shooting came from a passing vehicle, so a drive-by shooting. Wow. Uh, police were expecting to release video of the vehicle later Saturday and were offering a reward of up to $60,000 for information that leads to an arrest in the case. Uh, So they were saying of the little girl, she was starting the first grade this fall, and now that won't happen. And frankly, that is unacceptable to me, and it should be to every resident. Um, So they, so yeah. Where did this happen? So they, uh, this happened in Washington, D.C. Is there uh, a, is there a number to call for tips? I, I think I might have gotten this from the FBI, but I guess oh, okay. if somebody you can look it up. In, yeah, or somebody lives in Washington D.C., they could call their police station. Local. Local, yeah. Local, yeah. That's just horrific. So the mayor Muriel Bowser um, was saying that um, so community f- members confronted her and other city officials. They were demanding that they take action against the nearby liquor stores because they feel that they're attracting violence to the area. Um, They said that several other type of shootings of of that kind have occurred there. Um, I don't know if liquor is necessarily responsible for that, but um, the uh, Conti said the cowards cowards who committed this crime came into this community without any regard for human life, without regard for Naya's life and open fire. That cannot and will be not be tolerated. It is time for us to say enough is enough. Um, it says Washington has seen a spike in violent crime and homicides. Apparently there's a lot of that. That's what they said in Chicago, too, in the story yeah. I just read. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Chicago's bad. Homicides yeah. in the district are rising for the fourth consecutive year with over 100 killings already reported in 2021. Jesus Christ. So we're just uh, seven months into this year, and they've got 100 uh dead people. Wow. Uh, while it is typical to see a surge of crime in the summer months, the nationwide spike in crime this year defies easy explanation. Experts point to a number of potential causes. The people pand- have been locked up from COVID. Yeah, that might be it. Well, since the pandemic. And, and the mental, there's just like mental health. Like you've been blocked up. People are depressed, you know, anxiety, yeah. like there's all kind of mental illness going on. So, I mean, that's got to be a factor, right? Well, yeah, the pandemic that has killed more than 600,000 people in the U.S., worries about the economy, large gatherings after months of stay-at-home orders, intense Mm -hmm. stress, and even the hot weather. And, you know, as I've pointed out before, uh, domestic violence has increased, child abuse has increased during the lockdown. Um, And I'm not saying, well, it's only 600,000 people, but that's a very tiny portion of the population. So I don't know how much more necessary the lockdown is, but that's just... My opinion seems like yep. a pretty low body count to me, but you know. Yep. Well, what a, right, what's your last story? My last story is going to be from Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, good. Okay. I really, I'm, I think my my next week is going to be all Florida stories because I have been yeah. not doing any Florida lately. So I, I think I'm going to have to go some hardcore Florida. We got. We can't lose our our grip. Well, I have I have some <laughs> I have some affection for Omaha because one of my favorite movies about Schmidt that takes place there, and I love that movie. So okay, I've never, yeah. I don't know if I've seen it. I have to look it up. Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Nebraska man um, gets forty to seventy years in prison for ki- killing convicted child molester. Oh, okay. I know. I I, I I pick the best ones, don't I? Well, they love these. Yeah. <laughs> An Omaha man was sentenced to prison last week for shooting a convicted sex offender to death in 2020. James Fairbanks, 44, was sentenced to 40 to 70 years in prison on Wednesday, July 14th, 2021. Matteo Condolucci, 64, was shot seven times in his doorway on May 14th, 2020. Fairbanks shot Condolucci with a 9 millimeter. 9 millimeter semi-automatic rifle, the Omaha World Herald reports. Fairbanks completed no contest to second-degree murder and a gun charge in April 2021. Fairbank, 
Fairbanks had claimed self-defense, telling authorities he had gone to Condolucci's house to warn him to stay away from children, the World Herald reports, and said Condolucci's, Condolucci charged at him. Uh, Condolucci was shot three times in the front of his torso, three times in his back, and once in his temple. <laughs> that, that's not an accident. Condolucci was convicted of child molestation in Florida in 1994, and again in 2007 in Sarpy County, Nebraska, according to the World Herald. The Douglas County prosecutor said Condolucci had a history as an enforcer in motorcycle gangs in addition to the child molestation convictions, saying he was, quote, not the sympathetic victim, end quote. Fairbanks must serve 20 years before he's eligible for parole, uh, the World Herald reports. Authorities say Fairbanks didn't know Condolucci, but had found him in an Internet search for registered sex offenders, according to KPTM. Fairbanks also argued that he confronted Condolucci because he saw a play set in the backyard, a play set in the backyard. Joseph Condolucci, Matteo Condolucci's adult son, told the court he had set up the play set for his own child. Bullshit. So he didn't know this guy. He was just kind of like a, a vigilante, seems like, for... yeah pedophiles and kind of just went ham which but i don't unfortunately think yeah that th i mean this was he literally sought him out purposefully and went and killed him so that's i mean if somebody if you physically catch somebody in the act that's one thing but to like yeah, yeah. go to their door and kill them is kind of as aggressive no if you're not a cop stay out of yeah it. yep that wasn't i don't agree with that but no. That was my last one for the day. So did you watch um, that link I posted to the group about the female sex offender by any chance? No, I have not. Yeah, it's an interesting story. It's it's actually... You know you have to send links to me on my phone, otherwise sometimes oh, I yeah, well, <laughs> well, it's less... Well, it's funny because that seems like at first it's just, you know, you, you may feel some outrage, but then it, when you get to learn the story, it's actually more sad than that because she was like sexually abused from a child onwards her father not only raped her but like <sighs> informed her she was gonna have a baby for him and uh, oh god so her whole mind was just twisted from an early age into thinking that that's normal and mm -hmm. she ended up she sexually abused her son uh this guy that she met online made a deal where oh don't tell now i kind of want to read it really well yeah no it's a video oh, uh, okay and the, the deal was he would help her to move to California and settle in there because she was trying to get away from her family. But the deal was she had to have sex with her eight year old son on camera so that he could, you know, sell it as child pornography. What but in the didn't... actual fuck? Yeah. And he didn't make good on it either. Like it was a whole scam. He just, you know, disappeared. But she somehow the video got reported and she went to jail and she said her son has forgiven her for it, but at the same time, mm. you know, yeah, he's – and so she's – it just – it really seems like she just didn't – she didn't have a clue, right? So if you're – if your father's – and she had other people in her life, you know, molesting her and raping her, it doesn't excuse it. But I guess when you consider, you know, how that kind of abuse can it, – it, it goes on a cycle throughout generations and – that's it's uh, so sad. It's a very high likelihood that it can be passed on. So absolutely. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's at the group. Uh, it's like two or oh. three postings down, I guess. So. All right. Well, I'll have to go ruin my life and watch that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting YouTube channel called Soft White Underbelly, where they interview criminals and drug addicts and prostitutes and all kinds of other. Oh, people. I'm into that. Yeah, they're talking to people who've just basically. They have done or are doing things that mainstream society considers to be taboo. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, they're really high-quality videos. I recommend them. Okay. Nice. Thanks, right. Mark. All right. So on that note, uh, that's all for now. And uh, looking forward to entertaining everyone with more news stories of the macabre next week. Yes. Thank you for the submissions. You guys are amazing. Yes, I thank appreciate you for the that. Anytime. That good stories, yeah. Yeah. 
So if you guys see something like locally that hasn't been reported on, because that's kind of what we find. It's just there's like I've said over and over and over again, there's so many stories that are crazy that aren't reported on. Um, we'll report them. Send it to Morgan. We'll do crime, it. Crime is uh, the gift that keeps on giving. It's rampant. It never go away. You know? <laughs> we're, we're literally going to have a podcast. So we're fucking dead. <laughs> yeah. Forever and ever. All Sorry, right, my mouth so, is a little bit bad tonight, but I've had a really tough day, so I'm getting it out. All right, so this is Morgan Rector. And this is Rachel Telfor. Have yourself a great week, everybody. Enjoy. <laughs>